All right, hello everybody, and thanks for joining us today on Open Hour and on uh, Google Hangout. Really excited to hear some of the conversations that we'll have today. Um, we're going to hear a couple from a couple of presenters: um, Jeff Warren and Amy Soika. Did I get that right, Amy? Yeah, that's fine. Just, yeah, Great. that's good. I was like, and, hey. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of time for comments, questions, um, anybody who wants to pitch in. And I'll just throw it out there. Um, some of you have been on Open Hour here before, but there are slots available on um, the presentation itself. And, and even just to join in and uh, voice your comments rather than typing them, you can follow that link right there on the Open Hour page. Um, that's published right under where you would just watch it as a video. So you can watch it just as a video or you can click this link here below on the Public Lab post and join us on the actual video conversation. Um, if, you have, if you'd rather just watch and you still want to post some questions or comments, you can hit the Q&A button um, that's right next on the top right hand corner of the video and um, post in your questions. So. All right. I think we might give it a minute, if that's okay. We're we're a little bit low here. Okay. I think it maybe didn't go live right away. Just just give it just a second. We have a new message. You, Jeff, you can uh, click whichever speaker you want to see. Uh, yeah, on mine I can, but uh, I'm also looking at the audience view, and that one I don't seem to be able to do that. Um, well, the I, audience fine. view will actually follow my screen. Oh, okay. So I think maybe you have it uh, not selected. I don't think you have yourself selected or something like that. I have okay. to the desk. Anyway, it's not a big deal. <laughs> okay, we're. Um, I'm going to run through that again because we have some people on now. So um, if anybody wants to join us on this call, um, there's a link right below um, the video post and come on and join us inside. Here we go, got one. Hey, Matt. <laughs> How's it going? Good. Hey, I found it hard to find the link uh, on the page to join the open hour. It's much Wait. easier to join, like, to watch, like, on the Google Plus page that links to from when I say join open hour. I wonder how many people are watching this live who didn't find that they could actually join in the active. Um, yeah, that's what I was just. Link. I was just talking about um, because I can't. I post it. Um, I post it about 15 minutes before we start. Otherwise, I can't get uh, speakers in. So. Um. Um, yeah, so if anybody is watching um, just the video post, come on in and uh, click that link that's right below where you're actually watching it, and it'll click you into this window, and you can um, be a part of the call um, on, a, on a video with us. So, um, and I'll say that a couple times as we get more people, but if you'd rather watch it, um, that's great as well, and then you can hit the Q&A button and an enter comments and questions that we can see it as well. So, all right, I'm going to um, pass it over to Jeff, if you want to go ahead and start. Sure. Um, so um, I'm just juggling a couple screens here. Um, I guess I was going to talk today about um, some of the work that we've been doing on the oil testing kit, which is uh, sort of the more or less the reason we started developing a spectrometer, a, a, a DIY spectrometer in the first place. And it's, uh, I mean, many of you may be familiar with the project, but um, We've been sort of working on this for a few years with the intention of trying to identify uh, crude oil or other kinds of pollutant oils uh, from samples that you might collect uh, or that you have collected on beaches or on the street or, uh, you know, in your neighborhood. So uh, I was going to sort of walk through the, the, the whole thing, but I guess I was going to start by saying that we, we've actually started a little bit... Um, referring to this as the oil testing kit as a specific tool as opposed to just talking generally about spectrometry and I think it, it's partially because even the word spectrometer or spectrometry or um, 
there's many words and the, they're like not they're not particularly they can be kind of distracting and, and perhaps even intimidating to people who don't have a background in it. I mean, I don't have a formal background in uh, in science in general or or spectroscopy in particular. Um, and so we, we've sort of, uh, some of us have started sort of moving away from the term of spectroscopy, spectroscopy even though we are using it. It's just sort of one small part of the process, and it's one that, um, that I don't know, maybe it could be a little distracting sometimes. So anyway, that was just sort of a thought of mine. And and the other part of it is that I think, uh, as as I'll talk about a little bit, um, uh, increasingly I think the hard part of what we're trying to do in identifying oil is not the spectroscopy. It's actually the sample collection and the preparation and designing an, ex an experiment, um, you know, and, and other parts of it that don't have a lot to do with spectroscopy. They have to do with sort of collecting and, and setting up experiments. So, so anyway, um, let me... Um, let me walk through the, the basic steps, and to do that, I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay. Can you see that? Um, so the oil testing kit, we have a wiki page here. It's um, a slash wiki slash oil testing kit, uh, and, um, and it shows this image where it's like um, a laser... Uh, going through two sample containers, but kind of what I was talking about is like let's imagine you're actually you know going through the whole the whole setup, and I think a lot of a lot of uh, the documentation on our site actually focuses too narrowly just on scanning and lighting up samples and stuff. But let's say you like go out and you I went today to a to a drain, a water drain uh, on the road behind where I work, and I kind of poked around the edge of the drain to look for you know where motor oil might have collected after a rainstorm, right and this is something, I mean, I'm sure you've seen sort of sheens on the ground in a parking lot and things like that. And, and you know, ideally, those are the sorts of things we want to be able to actually measure. I mean, you know, if it's in the middle of a parking lot, it's likely to be motor oil. But it's a similar sort of situation to where you might find a sheen on a river or washing up on a river bank or on a beach. You might find a, a lump of uh, material after an oil spill. That's what we had often found after the BP spill and, and, and you know, suspect that it's crude oil. So those sorts of things. And so anyway, this this wiki page shows sort of like the process of taking that sample, uh, that chunk of something, as you can see in this picture. Here, I'll, I'll make it bigger. And, you know, here we're wearing a dramatic black glove, but like uh, taking that material and dissolving it so it's a liquid, so we can, do, we can, we can shine some light through it. Because it's hard to illuminate it when it's just, you know, crumbly bits. So here... We've taken a little bit of it and put it into mineral oil. Mineral oil is really clear and it doesn't doesn't fluoresce, it doesn't glow any color, on, you know. And I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But it's sort of a, a convenient thing to dissolve oily substances in. It's actually kind of like dry cleaning. When you take some of the dry cleaner, they they put it in a solvent and it it uh, it's not water. It's it's like a um, it's a solvent which will evaporate later. And and what we're kind of doing here is dry cleaning a piece of something from the beach. So we're, we're getting to dissolve in this mineral oil. Mineral oil is pretty safe, though. You can actually drink it, but once you put crude oil in it, don't drink it then. Um, and then what we do is we shine a, a laser through it. Um, it's a UV laser. It's the same laser that's in a Blu-ray player. And in this picture, you can kind of see that. I'm actually going to do this in real life, so I'm going to switch back to my screen here, and I'm going to show... Tell me how the, how the lighting works. Um, I'm going to show. Um, we'll take a box here. This is uh, a little jar of BP uh, oil residue. I mean, we got like a tar ball off of a beach in the aftermath of the BP spill, and um, you know, I, I guess actually, uh, realistically, we should say that this is an un this is an unknown. Um, but but you know, uh, it was uh, there was a lot of this washing up during then, so it's a, it's a fairly it weighs in on the known end of the unknowns. Um, and then uh, I'm going to take a, a blue ray laser. It's just a laser pen we bought on, on um, I think, on eBay. And then you can kind of illuminate this. And the, the light is... Uh, do, are you seeing that? Yeah, we're seeing. Cool. Yep. And then uh, we have a couple different ones, and I also have a, one here that doesn't have anything in it. I mean, sorry, it just has mineral oil, but no sample in it. And uh, I wanted to kind of shine it through 
a couple of these. So one thing you notice is when it goes through there, in, in the, 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 the negative control, which is just mineral oil, you just see purple. And that's just the laser. There's nothing else in there. In the second bottle, you see it's glowing this bright blue color. So that's the effect we're looking for. We're just trying to measure this and and uh, and sort of what I was talking about with the spectrometer being, uh, you know, a more complex way to put it. Essentially, what we're doing is just trying to measure the color that it's glowing, and each each oil will will glow a different color. So I'll put two of them here. You can kind of see that they're slightly different colors. If I take another one, this is actually fish oil, and I shine it through there. That's a, another sort of example. That's sort of a green glow. So each each different color. Is sort of like a, it's a fingerprint that can be used to identify the oil. And so, where we are right now in the in the project is like we have a spectrometer where we can measure the colors, uh, and I can demo that in a second. But the parts that are hard to do are like collecting it, dissolving it in some mineral oil so we can actually shine something through it, um, getting it to the right concentration. If it's too weak, it doesn't glow very much. If it's too strong, then the laser can't even go through it because it's too dark. Uh, and then on the other end of it, um, how do you set up a good experiment? So in, in this case, you know, we have like our, you know, our unknown, and then we have, you know, our, our mineral oil. That's our negative control. So we know that that is, they both are mineral oil, but only one of them has a sample dissolved in it. So this one should glow. So this one should glow, and this one should not. And then we want a positive control, and that's one that um, I'm uh, starting to work on a little bit. You can actually order crude oil online. So I ordered a bunch of these little vials of it. And I, I mean, there's different types. So presumably, we're going to use one that's actually from the Gulf of Mexico, and hopefully, one that's from a from a similar type of well, uh, you know, and not like a Venezuelan crude oil or a Saudi Arabian crude oil. So, so, and then that should, you know, look similar in color uh, to the sample that we have, um, assuming all else is sort of equal. Now, I just wanted to show you, Matthew and I and a bunch of others have started working on a way to sort of standardize this process. Because what we want to do is, um, when you look at this, you know, it's not enough to just say, like, oh, look, it's a different color. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, look, it's a different color. Uh, we want to be able to uh, point a spectrometer at it and sort of graph the color. Uh, you know, uh, we'll get a plot where, and, and I can show this to you in a second, but basically uh, the x-axis is, is color and the y-axis is uh, intensity, right? So we started by, like, literally this box I'm holding here is was our first sort of uh, draft attempt at this. And uh, inside it is this sort of uh, conduit box, the electrical conduit box that we had been using as a spectrometer. Does this show up all right? It's mm -hmm. a little dark. I'm just trying to have everything. Is that like the original? Yeah, exactly. Original. And, and, yeah. and I've made a little area here to put a, a piece of, to put a sample in, you know, it sort of slots in. But, um, wow. and then I, I put a little hole on this end and you can stick the laser in the hole. And so when you do that, you can kind of light it up and the spectrometer is pointed at it just right and no, ex you know, very little light from the outside can get in. But um, you know, we just we want to miniaturize this a bit, and maybe we thought we could make it even without the, the metal conduit box. So we've been prototyping, and Matthew and I in Portland some weeks ago had come up with a design, um, which I had kind of been riffing on a little bit last week and, and a few weeks ago, and we wanted to make one that you could uh, fold up out of a single sheet of paper, kind of like our foldable spectrometers. So this is like an early draft, and then just pat last week I did a workshop in uh, Spain, and uh, Came up. I'm just going to put it up on a pedestal because it's easier for me to see the camera at the same time. This one, which uh, I did, I decorated to look a little bit like a Star Trek shuttle craft because I was um, thought that would be kind of funny. But uh, but it does kind of look like a you know. Uh, anyway, let's not let that distract us. Uh, basically, what it is is um, the it's actually the foldable spectrometer in the box. So and I wrote a research note on this. If you check out on the public website with the tag spectrometer. So we actually just took the the foldable spectrometer that people have been making for a couple of years now, and we put it in this little box and lined it up such that there's a hole for a laser again, and then in the top there's the same sort of spot where you can put a sample in, well, like, like that. And then what happens, and I'll point it this way, is you, you light it up, and 
and then you can place a phone uh, or a webcam kind of like this. And this is one where I noticed Amy had commented on it because this does this like you can tell the phone is too tall. So we have some things to kind of debug about this setup here. But I just thought I would I would quickly demo this working uh, so you can see it. Um, so if I slide. Um, where is it? There you go. Yeah, we got it. Cool. cool. So you can see that. It works all right, and there's sort of a dark, uh, a bright purple line, sorry, at the top, and that's the laser. And anything beneath that is fluorescence. So, uh, using the spectral workbench software, you can you can um, you know take a picture of that and then graph the intensity for each color, and then start to do matching. So. So I think that's that's sort of an interesting thing, and I, 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 you know, we want to be able to do this where people will be able to set up a good experiment for themselves. We don't. I'm not sure if we want to say that everyone should have their own sample of crude oil, known crude oil, as their positive control, or they should have to order oil from the same well so that they have a, a basis for comparison. Or if we just standardize everything else enough, we could provide those samples on the website. And then you could just scan it, and then if it matches close enough to what we've published, then that's good enough. So there's there's still a bunch of questions to be answered in that respect, but that's sort of the basic, you know, the big picture. So just to just to summarize uh, and and wrap up, uh, the steps are: you got to go out in the world and and collect a sample. You have to dissolve or dilute it in mineral oil. Uh, you have to illuminate it. That's three. Four. You have to measure the color that is emitted by it. Um, and then five, you have to compare it to, you know, something where you know it doesn't have a contaminant, and then something where you know it does have the contaminant you suspect. And I think it's a good idea to, to really, you know, like I have a bunch of these bottles here. So if I scan an unknown and I, I can compare it to, you know, uh, uh, kerosene and heating oil, and this is actually olive oil, so I don't think that's a good one to compare it to. But you know, a bunch of possible contaminants that are plausible. And uh, there's actually some good papers about this uh, that, that we've posted on the site over the years. Like there was one where there was a, there was an, a, an oil spill in a in a river or a pond, I think, and I think this may have been in New Hampshire. And uh, uh, there were three different suspected sources. It was either motor oil from passing or parked trucks. It was heating oil, which is what they thought it was from a heating oil company's storage facility, or it was like something else. And they went and they took samples from each of those suspected sources and compared it to, to the to stuff they recovered from the slick. And then it was a pretty good match to the heating oil. It was definitive, and that was actually used in court to, um, to uh, hold the heating oil company responsible. So that's the scenario we're kind of looking for here. And I guess, uh, yeah, I guess we'll wrap it up and, and go to, you know, questions, unless we want to do questions at the end. Um, but, well, I, let me just say one more thing. The things that we really want to be able to do or to finish this design, so it really is a, a foldable, you know, rigid thing that produces really consistent uh, readings, and it's sturdier than what I have here. Uh, you know, we want to use thicker paper or even plastic or something. And then we also, we're thinking that the, the step of lighting it up with a laser, there's actually a research note on the site from not too long ago from a guy who was suggesting, he got the alpha kit of this thing. It doesn't look like this. It looks more like the box I showed earlier, he pointed out that getting the laser to line up with like the slit is kind of hard. So one thing we thought of is instead of having this hole, we would just put a bunch of UV LEDs in the box, and it would light it from all sides really brightly. So that, that seems cool. plausible. Anyway, so those are some of the things we're thinking about in the future. And uh, just to say that it's very much ongoing and sort of uh, in progress. So that's it. I hope that wasn't too long. No, it's great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and if anybody has questions, um, you can, and you're just, and you're watching, you can hit the Q&A button, and uh, you can type in a question, and it'll come right to us. Um, and then if you want to join on the video chat, um, if you look on the page that you're watching on, there's a link uh, right there below that I posted that'll get you actually into this video chat. Um, and then you can ask comments or talk about your research uh, directly. Uh, with everybody. So I know there's a few of you who are just watching um, the online stream, which is great, and there's a couple ways you can get involved, the Q&A and the link. Um, all right.
Um, I guess, does anybody have questions right now? Or I'll just leave that open and we can scroll over. Um, I wanted to know if uh, Jeff had seen the Tech Titans. I'd sent him the link before, but I don't know if he's actually seen them. But they are pretty cool. So. Huh. Uh, I, what, I, I hadn't seen them. What, are they? It looks some kind of battery. They have, they're, it's like got a UV LED and an infrared LED and a white light LED in it. So. Oh, cool. Pretty cool. I was like, yeah, I, I thought, like, I managed to get one for free as well, so yay, free. No, I I was uh, I had come across it was really funny at the airport um, a little laser pointer that you put into the headphone port of your phone and then it powers off the headphone port and it was kind of like whoa you can power a laser off of a headphone port and I don't know whether they have to like I was kind of imagining they had to like play really loud music through the headphone port to make enough power to but I don't <laughs> think that's how that works uh, but they had to obviously I think you have to do something to the headphone port other I, mean, I don't think there's just a lot of power coming out of that port at a, all, all the time. Anyway, I thought instead of having to design a, like a little thing where you we have to put batteries in the box, I thought it, it it's kind of an interesting idea to um, actually plug the LEDs into uh, into the phone if we if you do it with a mobile phone. Um, mm -hmm. And then we could skip the batteries. But I mean, other people might want to do it with a webcam and it gets more complicated, so I don't know. Well, it's an interesting idea, though. Um, I've seen something similar done, so, but it was a stethoscope, which was like a stethoscope, so you know how, like, the doctors use a stethoscope? They plug it into the phone, yeah, like the, yeah, never mind. Anyway, right now, um, sorry. Great, Amy, do you, do you want to go? Are you ready? Um, yeah, I guess I kind of, I need to grab, like, two more things, and they're in the other room, so, yeah, um, we'll, uh, See if we have any questions here while you're going, I and mean, we can. Uh... Uh, I'm, just, I'm just thinking. I like. I could leave this like doing a screen uh, slideshow for you, maybe. Oh. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, which basically they're pictures um, of like what I've done so far, so that you can understand what I've done so far. So, start Great. screen share. I hope that there's nothing like terrible in these photos. If you see a picture of an orange cat. Just, you know, like, um, yeah, freak out, because that's a uh, cat, so uh, I don't know. Oh, right, okay, so these are pictures basically of Ash um, at um, in the area. They should be pictures of Ash. Hang on, they're not, are they? Sorry, it's going through all the pictures. Get her. Why is it doing that? Okay, so, sorry, because I haven't moved these to a separate folder. Um... Okay, I'll just show you individually the pictures. So, okay, so this is when I first got the spectrometer, blah, 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 from Public Labs. Oh, God, I, did you guys see something, like, terrible or something? Because, like, yeah, I don't <laughs> no. know. Just a lot of spectrometers. Very good. Okay, yeah, that was an interesting situation as well. Yeah, I, yeah. okay, so basically, um, so what these are basically, these are the samples that um, I went, so basically there's a place called Hazelwood, uh, which is a power station down in this place called Gippsland, near where I live, and um, we, well we, when I say we, me and this other woman, um, who I met through doing some activism down there, went down there and we took lots of samples of things, so um, this is stuff that we've already Okay, hang on, I'll just like forget getting these slides because they're in the other room. So so basically what these are, uh, so when I got my public lab spectrometer, I was really excited. Um, and um, I decided to use it to try to sample, so this is my public lab spectrometer, and here you can see um, the paper clip I put on the end of it, which the whole idea of this is that you hang um, like, you put a paper clip um, on, like, uh, so if you see the pouches I had before, oh, sorry, they're pictures of the cat, <laughs> which, okay, this is awkward because they're not in a different photo, and they're the slides that I was supposed to be using to do color theory, but uh, that idea is kind of, like, gone a bit poo-poo because um, I've ended up uh, breaking my public lab spectrometer 
I know it's a sad story, so. Um, okay. So, if you see these bags, um, which are basically, um, they're basically these little bags that I was putting samples in and uh, of dust in. So what we were doing was that um, me and this uh, wonderful woman called Christine, um, who drove me around everywhere, um, basically after this mine fire, um, we were concerned about the content of the ash um, in the surrounding area and whether it contained things that are potentially toxic and harmful to human health. But nobody had like any idea on how to... Uh, to be able to tell if that was the case. And so, because we kind of like have a bit of a like love-hate relationship with our local EPA at the moment, um, what ended up happening was um, we, so I went down, I bought the public lab spectrometer, I went down there, and um, me and this wom lovely woman called Christine went around and uh, we took samples um, in the local area of the ash. And uh, what, what we, um, so this is just like me with my gloves on because I'm trying not to contaminate the sample. And um, what I did was um, I just got some cotton wool buds and was just like scooping up dust into these little plastic bags. Um, and then not only that, but um, sorry, that's like a different picture. Uh, not only that, but we they're all out of order, which is annoying because I'm having to go through them. Not only that, but we also took a few samples of um, some water down there too. So if you see this straw, this is actually like, I, I, there was nowhere in the world that I'd be able to afford test tubes because like glass test tubes are amazing and wonderful and just so expensive. So um, these are basically some clear plastic straws that um, I ended up um, buying and uh, we were using them to take samples of the water because that's all we had. So um, I actually, hang on, if I just switch this back to this view, because uh, I switch this back to me. Screen share. Okay, is this me? Hello. So um, I actually have like the samples still, so they've been like in this like shoebox in a cupboard for some time. But um, we used the like thing that got me into Spectral Workbench was we used Spectral Workbench to actually try to analyze to some extent these samples. So, <laughs> so yeah, these are like the hazelwood samples. And um, so what we did uh, was um, I ended up um, using um, Spectral Workbench, um, the website, and there's actually uh, on my profile, there should be like a group um, Spectra image, and basically it's got like all the samples that we took, um, and they're compared to um, the light they were calibrated against and the thing to look for is so if you have like your light source then um, when you hold something in front of it um, which I also um, calibrated in the little bags as well because obviously it's going through plastic so that also like I guess acts as a filter of sorts but um, what um, you'll see is where you have your um, little, like, so you have your XY diagram, as uh, Jeff was talking about, and um, what you'll see is you'll see, like, little, like, um, dips um, of intensity, and so, um, and also, if, so yeah, just, um, I basically, like, the organic chemistry, like, the organic chemicals um, were obviously all in the water samples, and as for the dust samples, um, at that point, I didn't realize, but it didn't 100% work because of the fact that um, it's really difficult to actually look at solids with a spectrometer. But hey, I tried. Um, now, uh, my actual talk, I'm sorry about this. I'm just like so unprepared. So, um, okay, so basically, uh, what I was going to talk about was I was going to talk about color theory. Um, and um, so, like going back to like what are the line spectra? So basically, you have like um, there are these things called Fraunhofer lines, which scientists knew about for some time. And this guy called Fraunhofer decided to get like um, this. Uh, so basically, he decided to uh, get the spectra from the sun and draw lines on where there were significant lines 
and they're called Fraunhofer lines. But basically, um, it, what is that? What it's actually showing is like a, a map um, of the chemical composition of the sun. And so, um, like today, scientists are able to interpret that and say, oh, well, you know, this line because this line is dark here, this means um, uh, that. Um, because the star here, it means that this chemical compound is present and this chemical compound is present. And so I actually have an image to show you, which will explain this all in some extent. So this isn't mine, so I'd like just give a bit of attribution to the uh, person who um, did it, which uh, should be at the end, I think. Um, basically, it's like Harvard University. And so um, basically... Like uh, the this database. Actually, huh? The Hytran database. Yeah, the Hytran database. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And um, so, um, like, this actually explains like the uh, what you're seeing when you look at sunlight. So you have so this is actually like what all the gases in the atmosphere will look like on your Fraunhofer lines. And over in the like uh, this end, I guess you have. Um, Usually, like, this is the organic chemistry uh, bump here. But basically, um, you can kind of see how, like, they all, uh, all these compounds together can be seen in this one image at the bottom. Mm -hmm. They're all, they're uh, all combined, you're saying? Uh, yeah, pretty much. So, mm -hmm. um, so light, if you have your white, so basically there's absorption and there's emission spectra. Okay, and the difference between the two is absorption spectra is you have, like, this spectrum of full color that's, like, you know, um, all the colors of the rainbow, but there are black lines in it. And so the way that I remember that is absorption, so the B is, like, black lines. And then um, you have, and then um, where is... Um, uh, in contrast, the emission spectra is you have... Um, like just a black space, but you have these um, colored lines going for it, and they're emission spectra. Now, with the uh, absorption spectra, so you already have really intense light. So, because you have already have really high intensity with your light, well then, um, uh, wait, absorption percentage is this way around? Okay, think of the think of like the spectral workbench um, thing, but like think of it. I think this is like meant to be upside down. So this is a hundred percent light and then this is zero percent light but basically what you'll have is you'll have um your like you'll have the light source and then because the different compounds are present they're being um absorbed um so here you have like so with CO, uh, carbon monoxide for instance um you have for instance you have uh the, because like a light is shining at carbon monoxide, you will have um, the uh, intensity of the light will drop, and you will have like a peak like within like this uh, range of um, nanometers. So um, and yeah, all these images build up to make what you see when you see the um, gases in the atmosphere coming off the sun. So um, sorry for not being able to explain that more concisely, but here's a picture of the Fraunhofer lines to explain it um, in a bit more depth. And I also have an infographic somewhere that I can't find, but I wish I could because then I could just post the link in and it would explain everything. So, um, but these are um, basically um, Fraunhofer, um, and he drew black lines on where he saw black lines in the emission coming from the sun. Um, now, uh, what I wanted to show you guys today, and, like, this is because, like, I haven't, I broke my spectrometer, so I wasn't able to do the research I needed to be able to back up, like, using different filters, and I don't know if you saw, but I had actually prepared filters, because, funnily enough, you can actually use watercolor paints, um, uh, or acrylic paints as I've used, because I used acrylic, but um, you can use paint basically on a piece of plastic to make a filter, and the idea is that, so when you have your light source, 
Um, so you have, say, your light source is here, the white light, blah, blah, blah. And um, what you have is you have, well, if you hold a filter up, um, you will have the filter will actually block out um, all the um, light that is of that color filter. So, um, for example, um, so black just, fil like, basically black absorbs all colors. So um, you wouldn't get anything go through black. But say something like uh, blue, you'd have, well, all the blue light, um, I think it's, wait, hang on, maybe I've got this wrong around. All the blue light would be missing. Uh, no, wait. All the blue light would be magnified. I don't know. I'm sorry. My apologies because I, yeah, like I say, I that was what I was going to do the talk on and then my spectrum would have broke, so it's a terrible excuse, but um, yeah. Uh, so uh, I did another PowerPoint presentation, which hopefully is a lot better um, because basically it explains where what I'm all about and what I'm trying to use spectrometry for. So basically, um, what like my eventual hope is with these spectrometers is that um, so you guys all know what citizen science is. Um, and sorry for being so bad at doing talks. I really should have done a re pre run of this. So my apologies. But basically, um, so okay, so citizen science obviously um, is basically people who are citizens wanting to engage in science engaging in science and then um, it's up to the researchers to provide a data structure that they can attribute their data to. So um, uh, so basically, yeah, it's non-professional people like myself, um, I guess, taking part in um, providing data to um, organizations or researchers that, you know, want to structure that data somehow. Um, but um, what's happened is, so basically, um, I got involved in this because um, there's this place called the Latrobe Valley um, near where I live, which um, basically um, its main industries are uh, brown coal mines, plantations, and power stations. When I say plantations, I mean like fertilizer, trees, you know, you name it, like green gardeny stuff. And um, basically, um, it's home to um, 73,000. Uh, 846 people-ish. Well, that was the statistic from 2011, apparently. But um, basically, they keep on having disaster after disaster after disaster. And a lot of it's caused by the industry down there. So a lot of them have health problems. And uh, these are only some of the recent disasters. Um, and um, as a result of the latest disaster, what happened was um, the community finally got together and was like, well, um, that's enough of this, you know, we need to do something. So um, uh, basically, um, there are a number of community groups formed. And um, like what this shows is like basically the history of um, the air pollution. So um, this is before, so this is the mine fires, like the dividing event. So basically you had, um, so there are a number of power stations down in the valley and um, in 2005 the World Wildlife Fund actually labeled um, Hazelwood, which is the one that's on the edge of the mine that caught fire, as being the most polluting of all power stations in uh, operating in the world's industrialized countries. And um, uh, um, they, so there used to be like an um, air monitoring network, but it was privatized and a lot of it sold off and um, and uh, and so following like the inquiry what's been happening is that there's been an, an, a number of things that um, basically uh, have only come out about as a result of the community getting together and saying that they want um, stuff to happen and um, so one of the things that I'm trying to get um, people to do is um, to get involved in citizen science and potentially to use spectrometry to be able to monitor what's going on um, in the environment down there. Um, now, like uh, like I said, I kind of have a bit of a love-hate relationship with the EPA at the moment. So, um, and um, basically the EPA are doing their own citizen science project. So anything that like um, me and my friends decide to set up is like going to be just uh, us in the community. 
But um, this is the idea that we came up with. So um, basically, um, like there's this popular application in Australia that's used by uh, the local governing authorities called Snaps and Solve. And basically, um, lots of people down here have smartphones. So the idea is that uh, because smartphones are so frequently in use, um, what Snaps and Solve does is that people um, take pictures of incidents in their local area, and then they um, send them, they email them to the local council, right? And um, so it kind of simplified the process of reporting incidents to your local council. Yeah. Sorry, what's that noise? Uh, okay, it was Matthew, it's fine, I've, I've muted him. Okay, sure. And so um, basically, um, so that's that idea. And then there's also this thing called the Fluka Post Project, which um, is basically started by a guy called Dr. Martin Fluka. And the idea is that, so it's using the whole idea of people taking pictures again. And what they do is they do, um, so it's actually a citizen science project that's actually worked pretty successfully down here. And what they do is they have a post and they have you um, put a camera um, on top of the post. And the top of the post is actually angled so that it's viewing a specific point in the distance. And then people um, note down the post ID, which is on this uh, ID tag here. And there's also like a QR code, so you can copy the ID. And um, I think the QR code contains the email address or something. So like you email it off to the email address. But um, they have a public album online that um, basically allows you to uh, view um, chronologically the change in the environment. Now, what um, I wanted to see spectrometry used for was um, I wanted to see, um, so basically, I've seen it done before, um, but um, when you have like tourist spots, you get like these kind of posts with holes in, and they have viewpoints in the distance, so, like the normal, you know, there'll be a hole in a post and they'll show normal view. Distance. And um, kind of like it's a bit too complicated to have a spectrometer or to make one yourself. And so the idea was that, well, um, basically, actually, this is kind of a bit out of order. So um, the idea was, so sorry, I've borrowed kind of your image. So, but I think it explains quite clearly the parts you need to build a spectrometer. Um, and basically, um, so what um, the idea was was that, okay, so you need a light source and you need a slit and you need a filter and you need a camera and they're the basic things you need to have a spectrometer. So, um, and, well, so, um, and then I did this slide and um, basically, so um, most people don't realize it, but the sun is a light source and the sky is like a giant lens and then your eyes are like that slit and then your eyes are like that camera. So you're you're basically um, constantly engaging in the world of spectrometry, even if you don't want to. Um, and so, um, like, my idea was this. So if you have, okay, so the four things you need are a light source, uh, a lens, and a slit. Well, then um, what you could do was, and a camera, obviously. Well, then if citizen scientists provide the camera component, to capture images, then what could potentially be done is to modify it like a fluker post and attach relevant filters in place on the post um, so that it's at a fixed point. And then at that fixed point, um, basically, um, people who are out, you know, passing by that post can stop to take photographs. And then when they take the photograph, they can basically do what the fluker post do, which is to take a note of the time, date, and post ID. And then, um, uh, yeah, just basically, so similar to how AF, um, the Fleeker posts work, only then the final step would be that analysis would be take place um, on the photograph by um, either a lab or um, just volunteer citizen scientists. And that basically, from those photographs, the atmospheric abundance of different elements present in the air at that time on that day and from that point could be calculated as a result. 
So um, going back to this image, um, so um, I actually did like a here's one I made earlier. So um, which so if you think about it, like so the um, sorry for saying like so so many times, but I'm really not good at doing talks. So um, sorry about that. that trying. Um, so what you have is you have so a citizen scientist will have the camera component, and then the rest of it's all contained in the post. So the post will be pointing like um, at a specific site. So you can have a normal view image um, to calibrate everything against, because calibration is important, by the way, because um, you need to be able to um, compare everything um, to um, an original kind of the original light source um, to be able to do the addition and subtraction for the absorption or emission, whichever way around it is. Um, it would be absorption from these ones. So basically, uh, like, sorry um, for that not being that great, but uh, hang on, I'm just trying to get my share back. Okay, so like, here's one I kind of made earlier. So um, this is a piece of wood with a hole drilled in it. And um, what it's got is it's got the hole on this side is actually smaller than the hole on this side. So the hole on this side is actually quite big um, in comparison to this side. And that's because, um, I don't know if you saw, but I posted on somebody else's post, but I was experimenting with the use of cones um, to gather, um, basically, um, line spectra. So because, um, basically, the idea was that, well, a cone will still work as well as a slit because it's like a pinpoint. It's like a pinhole camera only, um, not as, uh, you know, fancy, I guess, because it doesn't have a mirror. and. Um, basically, there's a diffraction grating on the side there, which acts as a filter. So yes, I've cheated and used um, a, a uh, CD, um, but um, I would have thought that um, eventually uh, you can use so you can use wood glass or um, what uh, wood glass? Yeah, you can use wood glass to filter UV light um, and um, which basically, to get hold of it, like if you go to any photography shop and just ask for wood glass um, lenses, um, photography shops are great for doing lenses. Um, and yeah, so you can, um, so basically, um, this would filter just regular, a regular spectrum. But then um, UV light can be filtered by wood glass, and infrared light can be filtered by, um, I found out um, the, well, uh, wood glass also filters to some extent infrared light, apparently, um, depending on the thickness you get. But then also, um, you can use um, the black discs at the center of a floppy disk to filter infrared light, which I actually tried and it actually works pretty well. So um, it just depends on the intensity of your light source. And um, yeah, and so as a result of say being out in the field and a person passing by, and uh, hang on, let me just. Move my lamp so um, you guys can see. But basically, um, you can actually get a pretty good um, spectrum from just like through this. So hang on. Uh, trying to hold this still is really difficult. Or if this doesn't work, there are some pictures I took earlier, so hopefully that um, can show basically how this works. But um, I'm just trying to find the right photograph. Because I, I actually took some photos to try and explain how this works. So, um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I've been working on. So, um, sorry for not doing a great talk, but I'm no, not really. No. I'm quite I'm quite scatterbrained, so it's all piecemeal in my head, and uh, communication's not my forte. So, um, no, any great. thank you. Thanks, Amy. So, that was great. I loved your presentation. It was really good. Um, tell yeah. me, what's the what's the name of your uh, your wood blocks? Your oh, yeah, I actually like gave them names. So um, this is actually um, called um, Isaac and Newton, or Newton and Isaac. So um, <laughs> like what I named them, because basically this is uh, this is actually quite quite good because this one actually um, only because um, of the angle it's at 
only picks up the uh, UV um, uh, uh, spectrum. So, which yes, angle comes into it. Um, and I wish I could explain properly um, the science behind how that works. But um, I mean, if you think of the uh, basically um, Newton's the guy who started this whole thing off with his book on optics, and if you think of the Newton prism and how it scatters light. Well, um, a diffraction grating, which we will cheat by using, um, basically will absorb light from all angles, whereas um, a prism um, is obviously designed to scatter light at a specific angle. And um, depending on the angle, depends on what length of the spectrum you can view. So, yeah, this one just like views UV light because the angle it's at, and this one, um, uh, yeah, this one just for views the full spectrum. So I was actually going to try and find my photos of these posts. Does, yeah, does anybody have questions? Um, I know there's a few people watching. You can hit the Q&A button um, and post some questions on the oil kit, on spectrometry in general, on what these things can be used for. If you have your own research thoughts, notes, ideas that you'd like to share, um, go ahead and hit the Q&A or join us on here and um, we have a few minutes left to take those. Sorry, yeah, I took up quite some time. So no, like you did it. It was interesting. Yeah, so, well, thanks. Mm. Oh, um, just quickly for um, Jeff. Um, I'm just going to show you. This is what the Tech Titans look like. So, got UV light. Oh no, wait, that's white white light. Yeah, white light. Okay, so it's UV light, infrared light, and white light all in one. So, I thought that you'd find that interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we've been looking around uh, for different sorts of uh, UV LEDs and things like that, and. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if we can match those up with like what a headphone jack can produce, perhaps. I don't know. Sure, sure. Okay. All right, my uh, last call for questions, other thoughts, other people's research notes on spectrometry. Um, send them over, or uh, or uh, otherwise, we'll uh, just talk a little bit about next week. I just wanted to mention, uh, I, I just put this link into the group chat. I just published a research note that's a retrospective of different design things that people have thought about for our spectrometer over the past uh, three years, um, if you're interested. Yeah, I saw that. It looks awesome. A lot of little things I had forgotten over, the, over such a long period of time, you know? Yeah, tons of stuff I remembered that I didn't remember. <laughs> So we have a question um, from Becca, and that's, um, what challenges are you expecting to face in dealing with the government on your project? Uh, is that to Jeff or to me? I think that's for you, Amy. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Um, so, um, like, I don't really expect any many challenges, because at the end of the day, citizen science is for everyone, so it's for, by, you know, it's for everyone, and it's by everyone, and... Um, there are huge communities around it, so um, I don't. It's something that, um, as con concerning uh, scientific governance or um, government uh, authoritarian, I guess governance um, with the government in Australia, as in like the government, government as in federal, state level, local council level. Um, I don't see it as a problem because. Uh, hopefully everyone's wanting to be quite cooperative and hopefully, usually, um, they're quite open to um, scientific um, research groups going to them and, um, you know, letting projects take place. Um, and I know there are lots of political issues, but uh, not going into that. Um, uh, but um, with scientific governance, um, like, yes, I know that, for me personally, I'm not a professional um, scientist, but... Um, Hopefully, at some point, um, I can get. I'm hoping that um, maybe, um, like, the group that I belong to will be able to um, 
I guess, develop the right relationships and um, hopefully um, have local scientists participate. And um, I, I know of a few professional organizations that actually already do this kind of thing. Um, so um, I'm hoping on networking um, with those and hopefully um, maybe just trying to get those links and trying it so that I could get something like this in place. But um, it's just something that, um, I mean, I don't really see there being any issues from the scientific community um, from the fact that really um, citizen science is, like, by definition, meant to be amateur um, to some point. The only people, the, like, the place that professional scientists and professional governance comes in is actually um, with the data analysis. And so um, it's something that, uh, yeah, I like that's the part that the scientists to deal with. But as for actually gathering data, I mean, anyone can gather data. Anyone can, you know, share that data. So it's just something that, um, yeah, I don't see it being an issue. So great, thanks, Amy, and thank you, Becca, for your question. That's that was a good point. Does anybody else have any questions or thoughts? All right, I'll give you a minute to mull it over while I tempt you with next week's open hour. Um, next week, July 21st, uh, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, we're going to do um, uh, a session on water, and we're going to hear from the Open Water Group. Um, we'll hear a little bit about the Riffle Development, which is a tool being used um, and developed to measure conductivity and temperature um, with all these opportunities for other things um, by Don Blair and Catherine D'Ignazio. And we're also going to hear a little bit about um, the Potentio stat being developed by Jack Summers next week. So tune in to hear about um, some exciting tools with water development. And, um, and we, uh, yeah, hope to see you there. And uh, Becca says, right on, thanks, Amy. So I'm not sure if you can see that. But. Well, I can't see that, so I don't know which one <laughs> All right. I think it's just me who can see the questions and comments, so I can read them out. That's great. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks for presenting today, Jeff and Amy. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. All right. Have a good thanks. evening or, or good morning to you, Amy. Well, yeah, good morning, and, you know, like, I kind of, yeah, just slept rough, so, but, yeah, hopefully thanks you've got the mic. Out of there, so yeah, cool. Thanks. Bye. 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 Okay, bye.